I could not be more thankful to be a part of, of the family of God. And I hope um, that if you're a part of our family, your heart is also full. And if you're not, you would consider what great God would allow something like this to happen. Um, so, and now I get to preach. So I'm going to do it. We have our kids from 6 to 11 in here for the first time today. So if you're here and you're normally in class, would you raise your hand? Go ahead. If 6 to 11, you're normally in launch or shift, raise your hand. In fact, just stand up. Go ahead and stand up for me. Go ahead. Everybody look around. Let's welcome them. Hello, everybody. Okay. Glad you guys are here. Really, I really mean that. And uh, I want to say a couple of things to you guys. You've been made in the image of God, and God loves you, and you're smart. And you can understand the things of God because you're learning all kinds of other hard things in your life. So lest we think you can't learn these things about God, of course you can. And so I'm glad that you're here, and I'm, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in your life. And we want to do everything we can, not just to help you, but parents, we want to help you guys as well. And so one of the ways we've been doing that is on the back table, hopefully you got one of these when you came in, it's a copy of the Cam Kids Sermon Notes. And in it, there's just some really helpful questions that kids of various ages will be able to track with the sermon, engage in the service, on the back side, parents, we recognize that our job and privilege as a church is to partner with you, but it is, as a parent, my primary duty to teach my kiddos. And so as we come alongside of you, one of the ways we want to help you do that is on the back side of the Kim Kids Sermon Notes, there's questions for the family. So as you're going home today, you have the chance to ask them, hey, what was new today? Uh, what is something you learned about God or, or Jesus? And what is one thing that you want to do differently because of what you learned today? These are the types of conversations that I plan to, Lord willing, be having with my kiddos as we're driving to my daughter's hockey game this afternoon. And um, so be encouraged. We love you. We are committed to you. And we believe that the kids in our midst are our future pastors, members, missionaries, and they matter now. So let's be faithful to that end. And one of the things we've been implementing over the last several weeks to prepare for this is the word of the day. And you should be, if you haven't yet, you should download the app, turn on your notifications. Every Saturday, you're going to get a text that says, Sunday's coming. I should say the best day of the week is coming. Maybe it'll say that this week. And you can prepare by doing two things. You know the text that's going to be preached through the text that you get, but also in the loop that you get when you come in. It'll tell you next Sunday's topic or passage is. You can read that passage with your family or just by yourself. If you don't, if you don't have a family, you're just kind of like going through life and figuring it out, then read the Bible that, that you get in the text and then consider the word of the day. Someone tell me today's word of the day. So, someone a little louder. Desires, all right? So kids, on your sermon note deal, I'm not going to do this every week, um, but there is, you got the story of the text, the sermon title, the big idea, which you don't know yet, or the word of the day. So write down desires, all right, desires. Um, when we think of desires, I kind of wonder what comes to mind. Desires, um, are they good or are they bad? Is it something that inherently has some sort of morality to it? Or is it just a, something that's neutral, that kind of like fire, right? Fire could be used for really good. It could burn the house down, or it could be used to cook dinner, right? Maybe it's just something like that. Desires fall into that type of category. We're going to be talking about what the Bible says about desires today. I want to show you, show you two pictures and ask you which one you might desire more. The first one is just a slum, um, likely somewhere in East Asia, Southeast Asia. But this is a very common picture in places like India, frankly, where population is overrun, it's not sanitary, and this is, it's a slum, and there's water that runs through it, and there are people that, that clean their clothes here, some people bathe, kids play in it. It's a slum. Um, how much, I wonder, do you desire that? Let me show you the next picture. This is in, um, I think it's, you, you, it's called Mauritius. I may be saying that incorrectly. It's a beautiful island off the east coast of Africa. And it has this weird illusion to it where you look at it from the sky and there's an underwater waterfall. It's incredible. Um, but that is a coast there on this island. Anybody desire that over the first picture? Yeah, I mean, anybody desire the first picture? Well, I was talking with Pastor Jamie about this, and initially I said, I'm going to show pictures of mud puddles. And he was like, let me finish my, my spiel. And he was like, yeah, dude, but mud puddles are pretty fun. I'm like, okay, I'm glad he said that. I need to make it a little more of an extreme example. All right, now this is obviously ridiculous. These are two extremes. No one is really going to be desiring to spend time in the slum water. 
But this is what I know, what my heart is inclined to. The same thing that Esau's heart was inclined to and the same thing that your heart is inclined to. And C.S. Lewis, um, a fellow from uh, several decades ago, he has this quote that I was thinking about as I was preparing for this morning, and I want to share it with you. It's also up on the screen. C.S. Lewis says this, that we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Yet like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because we cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. He concludes, we are far too easily pleased. Now we may say these pictures are ridiculous, but in our hearts, I would propose to you that if we are not careful, we are going to go after that which has a temporal nature over the eternal promises that God extends to us in Christ. And that's the picture that we see from Genesis chapter 25. I don't normally do this, but right on the front end, before we even read the text, let me give you the big idea. The big idea is this. If our thinking is not Godward, our desires will lead us to sacrifice long-term joy for short-term gain. Write it down. It's worth noting that if our thinking is not Godward, our desires are going to lead us in a direction. And on our own, we are going to sacrifice long-term joy for short-term gain. Let me give you what we may just call a mini-synopsis or a quick overview of the story we read in Genesis chapter 25 at the end of the chapter. You'll remember, if you've been here for a little while, that Isaac and Rebekah, they have twins. And the story of Genesis is carrying out how God is intending to keep his promise to bring about restoration to all things after sin entered the world through man's rebellion against him. These things happen in Genesis chapter 3. And so now here we are all the way in Genesis chapter 5, and God is telling a specific story that is timely for the people that have received it then, but also for us who receive it now. So Isaac and Rebekah, they are the chosen couple of God through whom the line of the promise would come that would culminate in Jesus himself thousands of years later. It's fascinating. And then Rebekah has twins, Esau and Jacob. And in their coming, God flips the narrative upside down. We would think because Esau is the firstborn that he might be the one who would receive the, the blessing and the inheritance and all the things. But we find that actually, according to Malachi, a minor prophet who would be uh, after this book, and also Paul in Romans chapter 9, that God sovereignly chose that Jacob would be the promise bearer. So we see Esau becomes a skillful yet impulsive hunter. He's actually his dad's favorite. Jacob, on the other hand, becomes a quiet and even-tempered man, and he is his mom's favorite. And one day, as it goes, Esau returns from hunting, and he finds Jacob preparing red stuff, is really the Hebrew, and his greedy desires drive him. Esau's descendants, the Edomites, would share their, these impulsive desires. Esau would swear to give Jacob the birthright for this red soup, Jacob doubles down. Esau says, like, man, my birthright is worthless. I'm going to die. So Jacob wants a confirmation of the sale before he gives him the food. This is where uh, it comes into play that you remember when Jacob was born, he was holding on to the heel of his brother. It wasn't some, like, really cutesy, like, oh, they're intimate and already best friends. No, no, no. This is a picture of what's to come, that Jacob is going to grab the heel of his brother and yank him down and deceive him and take that which was, according to human custom and tradition, intended to be for Esau, which was the birthright that we see swapped in this text. Esau swears to give it away for the soup. He gulps it down. He goes away. And then the text says that he grows to despise his birthright. We also find him despising his brother as well. So that's the overall snapshot uh, from maybe 10,000 feet. But we're going to read it in its entirety now. So if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. We're beginning in verse 27. And we're going to read to the end of the chapter. If you're able, I would invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Yes, thank you for doing that. We have free Bibles. Does anybody want one English and in Spanish? Um, they're also along the back walls on the tables. If you grab one, open it right up to where the bookmark is, and you'll be right at Genesis chapter 25. All right, if you got it, you know the deal. Okay, Genesis 25, 27. When the boys grew up, the twins, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And, I, and Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I'm exhausted. 
Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright. Now, Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob says, well, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank and he rose and he went his way. Then Esau despised his birthright. God, this is your word. And as we t- come to it, we recognize uh, without you opening our eyes, we will not be able to behold the things that you have for us. So we pray that by your help and spirit, you would do that now for the glory of Christ. We pray in his name and God's people said, amen. You may be seated. All right, remind you of the big idea that if our thinking is not Godward, our desires lead us to sacrifice long-term joy for short-term gain. That's kind of where we're headed. And, and as you're thinking about this big idea and how the story unfolds, I want to share with you a proverb that has meant a lot to me as I've been growing in Christ. It's Proverbs 18, chapter 18, verse 1. Whoever isolates himself breaks out against all sounds judgment, seeking his own desires. And what I would say to you is that this story is a perfect picture of what Proverbs 18.1 warns against. Seeking your own desires as you break out against all sound judgment. Sound judgment is thinking and acting in a wise way that ultimately culminates in the fear of the Lord. As we look at this phrase, sound judgment in the Hebrew, that's the, that's the, the conclusion that w- the reader would come to if we just did a word study on that phrase, sound judgment. So there are two desires here that we find in the text. We find the desire for the birthright, which we would recognize as having more long-lasting gain, and then we have the boiling stew, which is going to satisfy for just a short period of time. So Esau comes to Jacob, and he says, Take my long-term joy, and I'll take your short-term gain. And as the story unfolds, as it were, I will share with you kind of three, three points along the way. We find a perceived need, a pushy solution, and an absolutely pitiful outcome. Um, a perceived need, a pushy solution, and a pitiful outcome. But I don't just want to think, it about, think about it in terms of like concept. I want to show you how I believe that this works out in our lives as well. Because if left to ourselves, I don't want to say we will stray. I want to tell you, you probably already have in some ways. And I have. And you are likely going to. And I am likely going to in some ways. The degree of our straying, I don't intend to know that. Um, but we're thinking of them and then, right? The Israelites would have received this story. And they are constantly given an opportunity to doubt if God is really going to provide for them. Despite already being ransomed from Egypt in, in, God, in Pharaoh's power and being led by Moses and God ultimately to the promised land, the, the people receiving the story are in this in-between. And they've seen God's power. They've sang of his greatness, like we have. But life gets hard, and they're tempted to doubt. And these things come along, and they think, ooh, that I bet will satisfy me more than God. They, they never actually say that, but that's where their hearts go. That's where our hearts go. And so as we think about them and then, we also recognize us and now that we're no different. We're no different. And let me give you a character sketch. Esau, the oldest, he's a skilled hunter. He's an outdoorsman. But according to Hebrews 12, right, we read the Bible in light of the Bible, it says that he was short-sighted and impulsive as well. So you want that reference, Hebrews 12, 15 to 17. It'd be good for you to continue that character sketch study. Isaac loved him for his food, it seems. Jacob, on the other hand, second born, was a quiet man. Um, this word quiet in the uh, quiet man um, that we find here, it, it, it refers to who one that has like a calm temperament. He's reasonable. He's, he's mature. And he's loved by Rebekah. Is it because that God told Rebekah that the, the older would serve the younger? Don't know. There is some sort of parental pattern maybe, but Abraham was sympathetic toward Ishmael. Sarah loved Isaac, and thus maybe this continues on. I'm not sure. So Moses is speaking to the original audience, and this is not just a story. It's not just a story for them. Beloved, it's not just a story for us. It's a warning. And the process that we see of seeking your own desire goes like this. Let me show you. It's going to be on the screen. We, we see something in our lives, and we say, I have an urgent need. And then, if we're not careful, we think, what can I do to figure this out? And then when we figure it out on our own, we are eventually going to get to the conclusion where we ask ourselves, can I ever, 
recover from the trouble that I've gotten myself into. That's the progression that we see these brothers go through. Look at verse 29 of Genesis chapter 25, if you will. Genesis chapter 25, verse 29. It says, Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Maybe he came in with a type of heart that we would have when we have a perceived need and we say, this is urgent. I have an urgent need. You've heard the phrase, making a mountain out of a molehill, right? This is exactly what this dude is doing. I'm not saying he doesn't have a need. And I'm not saying that in my life, when I have allowed it to escalate, that it never started from an actual legitimate need. Oftentimes it does. But when we break out against all sound judgment, that which we see as like a, an important need becomes a really urgent one. It's been a long day. It was a futile hunt, meaning he didn't really come back in with anything, and the dude is hungry. Listen, there's no sugary snacks on the way. He doesn't have like those little Gatorade packets. He, he's out there doing his thing, and he comes back in, and he is famished. Like his blood sugar's low. He's getting shaky. He's getting tired. He feels pretty bad. Maybe, just maybe, he really believes that he's about to die. Um, but what I see and what commentators generally agree with is this is the type of a guy that we would just call hangry. Anybody get hangry in the room, right? That's the icebreaker for community groups this week. So we're going to know, like, if you lie now because you're going to be in a smaller group this week. And then and when he gets hangry, I get hangry. And when I get hangry, evidently I'm like this dude because sometimes I can get a little impulsive in my desires. I'll be telling myself, I'm going to control what I'm eating. And then I get a little hangry and I walk in and I'm going to eat the first sweet thing that I see. And not the first, but the second, and the third. And the, anybody with me? Okay. Um, impulsive desires come out whenever we, we feel like, I've got this urgent need. And, and the outcome is long-lasting. And for what? To meet this urgent, urgent need that he had. I think we can all probably appreciate this. Because when we let something become urgent to us, it crowds out the important. I mean, think about the difference between these two things. Two terms. When we let something become urgent to us, we crowd out the important. So, beloved, friend, what is urgent? What is urgent to you that is making important things foggy? It's a good question to ask of the text. What is urgent to you that is making important things foggy? Because the, the urgent is often driven by desires apart from sound judgment. Maybe it's a purchase. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's, it's a project. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is for you. And, and, and Romans 1 says that we are, without God, we are inventors of evil. And so the list is unlimited on how many ways we can be convinced that something is actually urgent when it's not. So what's urgent in your life that is crowding out the important? One of the ways that I've been able to see this reality fleshed out is through one of our ministries called Local Compassion Initiative. That, in fact, Laura, um, in light of her ongoing health challenges, has continued to lead faithfully. There's some training going on right now. And this is our effort to help people who, who have a perceived urgent need. Because generally, someone will come to the office and they'll say, I need help. And it's generally of a financial nature. And so instead of just slapping a Band-Aid on it, um, Laura has worked on creating this system of teaching for members of our church to say, okay, I'm going to meet you where you are, and I'm going to look at this from an objective position and say, urgent requests met with sound judgment can actually create long-term health. And that's what she and her team and our church body is working to do. And long-term health has come from several of these opportunities to engage people that come knocking on our front door. I have an urgent need. But it's easy for us to get off the rails, break out against all sound judgment, and then we start making some short-term decisions that have long-term consequences. And Esau's exhaustion was urgent to him. Even life-threatening. That's the progression of Proverbs 18.1. I have an urgent need. And if, if you're convinced you got an urgent need, then your response is probably going to be like Esau's in verse 30. So he said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew. I'm exhausted. So Jacob the heel grabber, it's coming into play. He ain't the cute little baby, right? He's like, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, Bert, I'm about to die, man. You think the birthright means anything to me? And so Jacob's like, okay, then swear it to me. So he swore to him, 
and he sold his birthright to Jacob. His perceived need. Perceived means that you're looking at something and you're, you're coming away with a certain conclusion. You are thinking something based on what you're looking at. Your perceived need. His perceived need is self-focused. So the pushy solution then ends up being driven by what he wants as well. So we go from having this urgent need then to asking, like he did, what can I, I want to emphasize that, what can I do to figure this out? And generally what's urgent in our mind, it does not leave room for conversation. It doesn't leave room for me to call my brother and be like, hey, dude, this feels really pressing. Help me think about this. No, 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 it's urgent. Like the house is on fire. I got to put it out. That's what Esau is doing. And that's what we tend to do when we allow the urgent to crowd out really the important. What can I do to figure this out? So he has this perceived need. And then there's a pushy solution. Panic sets in. You know the feeling. Or maybe it's excitement, right? I mean, let me be honest. Sometimes I put some things on my Amazon list and it'll say, hey, buy it now, 40% off. You only got three hours. I'm like, let's go. I'm buying it. I'll, I'll look at the budget later, right? Um, so it may not even be like crazy, crazy, but maybe it starts small. But if those things go unchecked, the direction of our lives, we create more and more and more pushy outcomes. And then the, our habits become our character, lest we think this isn't a big deal. It's a major deal. A perceived need leads to a pushy solution. You can't rely on anybody but yourself. i got to come up with a solution. The anxiety is, is crippling. We isolate ourselves. We start thinking real foolishly. Esau says, verse 32, I'm about to die. Come on, man. Like, it's been a day. You might be really, really, really hungry. But were you, was he really about to die? I think he could have a, he would do well to wear a shirt like this. It's my little girl, Hattie. And uh, some time ago, she came downstairs, and she was wearing this shirt, and I was like, I just got to take a picture with her. Hold on a minute. I'm busy overreacting. <laughs> Esau, that's Esau, all right? Hold on. Let me act like this famished nature of mine is going to lead to my imminent death. He's overreacting is the point. This is what happens, right? We've talked about the TEA. We have thoughts that we linger over longer than we should. And we have emotions that lend to a certain thing that sort of double down in our thinking. And then we don't just stay with our thoughts and our emotions. We ultimately make action. We, we take steps. It leads to actions, thoughts, emotions, actions. So Esau is hungry. He's thinking, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And suddenly, somehow, in some time, it goes from being really hungry to famished to like, I'm about to die. So then what does he do? He makes this irrational, pushy decision. He comes up with a solution that is terrible. Terrible. This is what happens when you go off the rails. So what action comes when he breaks out against all sound judgment? Verse 30. I love this. Now, I don't read Hebrew. Thankfully, I read books that people who wrote know how to read Hebrew. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known this fun little fact. He says, let me eat some of that red stuff. And in the Hebrew, it's this clumsy, like, this dude comes in. He's like, red stuff, red stuff, red stuff. Like, that is literally how the Hebrew was written. And so you can imagine the red dude is wanting the red stuff. And Jacob's like, here's my chance. Uh, this dude is an idiot. Um, uh, Esau thinks that he is the one that is hunting, but really he's the prey. And it's not that he's the prey of Jacob. He's the prey of his own isolated desires. And so Jacob says, sell me your birthright. And you can hear, hear the tone. And if, swear to me then. If you're so hungry, swear to me. So Jacob swore to him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And here it is. Esau throws away long-term joy for short-term gain. We're just like him, ain't we? And that's the promise of sin. It makes promises that it can never keep. And sin, if we let it, will take us further than we ever intended to go, and it will keep us a lot longer than we ever thought we would stay. And here Esau is giving up lasting joy to satisfy his hunger pains. And maybe you can appreciate that. This will be the last bite. It's the last time I'm going to click the link. I know... I shouldn't send this angry text. It's my last one, but I got to get this off my chest. Like, we are just like Esau on our own. And this is not behavior modification that I'm talking about. The only way, the only way that we stop breaking out against all sound judgment and seeking our own desires is by a true, genuine heart change. And that's the whole point 
that Moses is getting after by chasing the genealogy from Genesis 3 all the way to the Messiah who would come. That's why it's such a big deal. Because they know that it's only through him that anybody will be able, be able to f- be fixed. We got this hole in our heart, friends, and we try to fill it with all kinds of things. That's what our desires are doing. We, it's not wrong to have desires, but we're sinful people. And so then our desires are going to feed naturally what we are telling ourselves is going to satisfy us. But it never does, ever, ever does. And then we end up chasing the rabbit, right? And it takes us further than we ever thought we'd go, and it keeps us longer than we ever thought we would stay. And so we desperately need the Messiah to come. That's why they're tracking all the genealogies and the family trees and the family histories. It's not like they got some some, uh, interesting fascination with Ancestry.com like some of us. It's about like, this dude is coming. God said from Genesis 3, from the line of the woman is going to come one who will crush the head of the line of the, of the serpent, which we know to be Satan. So we're waiting for that dude to get here. And he is our only hope. And here we are, thousands of years later on the backside of this, and we know that this line from, from, from Isaac and, and from Jacob and, and through the line, we course it from the Old Testament even into the New, that it culminates in one, the Messiah, the anointed, the one that has come from God, God himself, the Son, Jesus Christ, who has lived absolutely perfect when he came on this earth. And he died sacrificially on our behalf, not because we deserved it. And he rose from the dead so that whoever would place their trust in him alone would be saved and will be changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, whoever's in Christ, the old has passed away and the new has come. So friends, we're not talking about um, we're, not, we're not looking at this text so that we can m- modify our behaviors so that we can, we can live the right life. We're talking about recognizing that on our own, we are in a world of trouble, and we desperately need somebody to change our heart. And when God changes our heart, he changes our hands. And we live for him, not to obtain his love because that's not possible. We consider that in our minor prophets class this morning. God's, the object of God's love is not because we're lovely. It's because he is, and he's full of mercy. And so would you come to him if you haven't and experience real heart change? And this text may, I'm sure, will make more sense to you and more more applicable to you. The gospel leads us to long-term joy over short-term gain. It's not comfortable, it ain't easy, but it's joyful. It's full of purpose. There's nothing like it. So we may be able to identify a need in our life but we most likely are not the ones to satisfy that need. When we say, when my feelings tell me, I've got this urgent need, I should learn to let that serve as an alarm for me to talk to somebody close to me. Hey brother, sister, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing this need in my life. Can you help me reason through this? I promise you, unless you've got this gaping chest wound and you're legit bleeding out, it's probably, probably, hear me, not as urgent as your feelings are telling you it is. And when we allow the urgent to crowd out the important, we make decisions that are going to rob us of long-term joy for the sake of short-term gain. It's never worth it. It's never worth it. So we got to get to the point where we're saying, not, what am I going to do? But, God, what are you going to do about this? And we learn to Wait patiently, pursue him, and follow him so that when our needs are met, he gets all the glory. And frankly, if I have a perceived need in my life that is not being met, then I should ultimately ask the question, is this a legitimate need? Because God knows my needs more than I do, and he told me that he's going to meet my needs. So if I have a perceived need that has not yet been met, then maybe it's not really as urgent as I think it is. Esau got caught in that, and his reaction is a proof, a proof of that, what I'm saying. Genesis 25, 34. So the whole thing unfolds. Red man wants the red stuff. Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. He got his way. He ate, he drank, he rose, and he went his way. And Esau despised his birthright. You break out against all sound judgment, and this will happen. You'll convince yourself that I have an urgent need. There will be one solution in your mind. What can I do to figure this out? And you will be left with a pitiful outcome. Because eventually, if I follow this path, if you follow this path, 
we'll ask ourselves, can I recover from the trouble that I've gotten myself into? And maybe you've already experienced this, and you've known the grace of God, and you realize that, no, there's no way that I can get myself out of this. I need someone bitter, bigger, better, stronger. But when we hastily take matters in our hands, there's always a bad outcome. That's one of the reasons why I think Solomon, as he's writing to a son, we have the book of Proverbs before us, he tells him in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, if you have a Bible, just turn there. This is, this is what Esau should have been hearing. This is what we need to hear. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The heart is not in the Hebrew language, which is the language that the Old Testament was written in. It's not talking about the muscle in your chest that's beating and pushing blood all throughout your body. The, the heart, when the Bible refers to the heart, is talking about who you are at your core. At your core, Trust in the Lord. And don't lean on your own understanding. We're all leaners. We're all leaning on something. Lean on him. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This is similar to Adam and Eve, right? They had this perceived need. They were deceived by the enemy. Like, hey, you know God is really just keeping something from you. He doesn't want you to be like him. If you eat this, your eyes will be open, knowing the difference between good and evil. You'll be like God. They have this perceived need. They push for a response. And still today, we're picking up the pieces. Actually not. We're the pieces on the ground that Jesus is picking up and putting back together. Esau executed his plan for momentary pleasure. How often have you been tempted to, to do whatever you need to do to just get what you wanted in the moment? It went his way. He got it. He had a full belly, and he walked away with a shallow heart. And that's what happens when we forsake long-term joy for short-term gain. It said that Esau despised his birthright. What does that word mean? It means that he didn't appreciate that his birthright was linked to God's plan of redemption for the whole world. A bowl of stew carried greater significance. He looked at his birthright with contempt. It means that he looked down upon it. He looked at it as if it was worthless, when in fact it was the most valuable promise that he could have ever clung to. And he said, I'd rather fill my belly right now. What am I filling my belly with more than the things of God? What about you? Esau walked away probably satisfied with himself in reality because he looked down on his birthright. He didn't at the time walk away thinking like, what have I done? There is a way that seems right to a man, and in the end, it leads to death. And there was coming a day when he would grieve, but it wasn't that day. He lost his birthright. As the story continues, and by God's grace, we're able to look at it together, you'll see that not only did he lose his birthright, but he also lost the blessing, two separate things. And afterward, when he wanted to go back and inherit it, he was rejected. Hebrews 12 says, even though he sought the blessing with tears, he couldn't change what he had done. But thanks be to God, while we have breath in our lungs, that is not the case for us. So friend, beloved, let me ask you and tell you, what have you given up eternal joy for temporal gain? But God has been slow to anger toward us. And so the call would be to repent, to turn, and to recognize that what you've been pursuing ain't filling your heart. And only he can. And you turn and you follow him and you'll find a, a satisfaction that nothing in this world can ever offer. And it won't be temporary. It'll last day by day by day by day to all of eternity. May we not be like this one who sought the blessing with tears and ended up being too late. Because Matthew chapter 5, 25 tells us that there's coming a time when we will stand and Jesus will separate the sheep and he'll separate the goats. And there will even be people on that day, the scriptures say, where Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. But I did all these things for you. Look, it ain't about what we've done for him. It's about what he's done for us. We've got to cling to that and believe it and live, live by that. Are, are, are you above the promises of God? Do, do you find the goods of this world more attractive than knowing God? One of the group questions this week is, how might you be tempted to treat your spiritual inheritance, Christian? And you may have forsaken it. You may be walking in sin. The reality is that if you're in Christ, you're secure in Christ. But we can, we can stray and, be, and begin to think 
Oh, the position, the money, the power, the sex, all the things that this world is going to give me, it's better than what I've inherited in Christ. Hear the call that that is a lie. And it will never give you what you promise. What is it that if you're a follower of Jesus, genuinely you've been convicted over sin, you've repented of your sin, and you've trusted in Christ alone for salvation. By grace, through faith, 1 Peter chapter 1 tells you what you have inherited. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According not to our works, but to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's not give up this eternal joy for some short-term nonsense gain that this world's going to give us. But we're just like those Israelites in the already and not yet. It's hard right now, full of temptations, full of challenges, full of promised desires. It's not worth it. And unlike the Israelites, our promised land, the eternal heaven, it will be sin-free. It will be temptation-free. But until that day, temptations abound. So will you focus your life and your eyes Godward, beloved? Because if our thinking is anything other than Godward, our desires will lead us to sacrifice long-term joy for short-term gain. The band's going to come. I just want to ask a question for you to consider as they come. You, would you maybe really consider prioritizing this a few seconds? Let me ask you the question. What short-term gain are you tempted to prize over long-term joy? All these people in this room, we're all on our own. We run the risk of being inventors of evil, all right? So was it money, sex, power? I don't know. We're all drawn towards something. But take a moment and consider. What short-term gain are you tempted to prize over long-term joy? Consider these things. Repent where needed, and as the band is ready, we'll stand and we'll sing unto him who is worthy.